Good evening. Thank you for coming to our author's reading of Inner Landscapes, True Tales from Extraordinary Lives, 40 Years of Writing in the Recorder of Western Mass with author Richie Davis. I'm Lori Wheeler, Director of the Arms Library. A number of local libraries are also co-hosting tonight's program. Cushman Library, Irving Public Library, Leverett Library, Sunderland Public Library, and Wendell Free Library. Richie's book is chock full of the people, the humanity of our local rural landscape and community. These are true stories that chronicle our history, originally appearing in the recorder. His stories are intimate and rich, letting us into the lives of those both well-known and those hidden in our hills. Each story highlights a person or persons bringing out their truths and what really matters. Inner Landscapes is really such an enjoyable read. When you get hold of a copy, sit down and savor. I'm going to give you a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit about Richie. Um, if you, most of you may know already, um, but he has won more than 35 regional news and feature writing awards as a reporter and editor for more than 40 years at the Greenfield Recorder. Beginning as the newspaper's West County reporter in 1976, he also covered police, courts, state and regional government, as well as environmental, energy, human service, political, and a variety of other issues. He also served as the newspaper's county editor, overseeing a network of town correspondents. He wrote dozens of in-depth series on topics ranging from nuclear power and the aging population to high-tech cottage industries. He won a Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting Grant for coverage of an effort between Leverett and Letcher County, Kentucky to foster cross-cultural dialogue. He served as arts and weekend section editor of the Springfield Daily News, as well as an editor of the Genesee Valley newspapers in suburban Rochester, New York. A graduate of the State University of New York in political science, he also took part in 2014 in Conflict Transformation Across Cultures Certificate Program at the School for International Training with participants from 26 countries. Uh, Richie has been a professional percussionist for more than 50 years, specializing in Greek, klezmer, and Sephardic music. And as a resident of Montague, he blogs at his website, richiedavis.net. So how tonight will work is that Richie will read for half an hour and that will be followed by Q&A. So please write your questions in the chat and then we'll get to them in order. And so most of all, just enjoy and thank you again for being a part of this. And thank you so much, Richie, for being here tonight. Thank you, thanks for having me and um... This is, uh, uh, I was telling, I was telling Lori before people showed up that um, this is just such an odd time to be coming out with a book uh, or anything else in the world, um, like a recording or something. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to, well, normally I would be going from town to town, to libraries, to bookshops, um, bringing my book around and, uh, you know, having copies uh, for you to for you to people to buy, I mean, uh, autographing copies, um, and instead everything is zooming. So um, I'm just so grateful uh, to to have this opportunity. Um, the book, uh, which I have a copy of here, um, is a, 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 you know I think of it as an expression of local. Um, because it's um, all the stories are locally grown. The book is the book was um, done in published in Athol, and um, and I've really made an effort to have it sold uh, at local bookstores instead of going uh, having people going online and buying them through Jeff Bezos. Um, so. Um, and the story, so the stories are all local, and the stories that, that I chose are um, are really universal stories. And um, and it was the hardest part was um, deciding, you know, what I was going to include. And now the hardest part is deciding 
which of the stories I'm going to read for um, for these Zoom sessions. And um, so um, the the one that um, I'd like to share with you is one uh, about Carol Purrington uh, from Cole Rain. And um, now the thing to tell you about all these stories is that they're all written in the in the present tense. And so uh, it's really to immerse you in the in the person in the time that they're uh, they're with us. And uh, fortunately, uh, Carol is very much with us, and uh, she's still writing her poems. The, the story was written in April of two thousand nine. A pond made by beavers fish now in the magic of twilight by a tall heron. It's time to go indoors when I'm not living at home. For 1300 years, the five line Japanese poetic form of Tonka has described images and the emotional world of the writer. In 31 syllables or less, Tonka are concise musical verses that date back centuries further than haiku, each line often capturing a date, uh, each line uh, often capturing a single image or idea, the five lines creating a single thought. Coleraine writer Carol Purrington's eighth book of Tonka, Gathering Peace, is the culmination of more than 15 years of specializing in the gentle Japanese form although she is flexible with the count and placement of syllables. Over the past 15 years, I've been finding words to fit my days into this ancient pattern, Burrington writes in the preface of the book. My hope is that these poems will be like stepping stones from my world to yours. The cover photo of Gathering Peace conveys the spaciousness of the landscape at Woods Lawn Farm. Her family's two century old coal rain dairy farm with verdant fields just across the dirt road from the classic white 1826 farmhouse. The scene with hills off in the distance approximate the eastward view of a bedroom window has afforded Purrington, who's been bedridden for most of her nearly 58 years. Purrington has been paralyzed with polio since 1955 when on her first day of first grade, she put her head down on her desk and complained of severe headache symptoms. It was the year that a new vaccine became, began to bring the disease under control. Greenfield recorder readers followed the young girl's progress month by month as she was hospitalized in Greenfield and then in 1956 at Children's Medical Center in Boston followed in 1957 by a rehabilitation center in Wellesley. She writes, left by my parents in a hospital room in isolation, the dark of their going, the dark of my staying. Purrington continued her schooling with the help of a dedicated telephone line to her classrooms at Coleraine's Elementary School, Mohawk Trail Regional High School, and eventually Greenfield Community College. There have been important technological improvements over the years. Fiberglass breathing aids in place of the iron lung, computer and voice recognition software to greatly expand the constricted world of someone with severe disabilities. Yet time passes slowly in Purrington's overstuffed room. Its creep is marked by the rhythmic whooshing of a pale green turtle shell ventilator that rises and falls on her chest and allows her to breathe despite her paralysis. It's been more than 10 years since Purrington has been able to spend part of her days sitting up, yet she's characteristically upbeat, buoyed by her Christian faith. It's been uh, with, with only some difficulty, she demonstrates how she turns the pages of the magazine suspended from an overhead rack using a foot long mouth stick. It has a rubber eraser at one end and a plastic base molded to fit in her teeth. Many years ago, she had a rack that could hold heavier books. When I was hospitalized in Boston, there were half a dozen children who were fairly severely 
disabled with polio, we were taught to turn pages and write with mouth sticks. It was her aunt Evelyn Sellers, another polio victim with whom she lived in the center of coal rain for a couple of years, who first suggested that young Purrington could become a writer. I love to read and there were some things I couldn't do, she recalls in a cheery voice. Making eye contact with a visitor with the help of a small mirror attached to the head of her bed. She discovered Tonka around 1990, about a decade after she began writing more compact haiku. One of the haiku magazines she was receiving at the time ran a Tonka contest, which she entered. I fell in love with the Tonka form, she recalls. I read some Japanese Tonka in translation and some English language Tonka. I really enjoyed the spaciousness of the form after dealing with 17 or fewer syllables. To have 31 or fewer syllables felt great. After she fell under the enchantment of putting words together, Purrington introduced Tonka to her neighbor, Larry Kimmel, who helped her work on her first and subsequent books and co-authored A Spill of Apples with her. Uh, these aren't in order. The, the photos aren't in order. Um, just so you know. We've been gentle but honest editors of each other's work. Her poems have been published in the Christian Science Monitor and have won the Tonka Splendor Awards, the Tonka Splendor Award and numerous international contests sponsored by a variety of poetry writing associations. At first, Purrington printed with the help of a mouth stick. She began using an electri electric typewriter with an automatic carriage return requiring one of her 10 siblings or her mother to advance to the next line. In the beginning, she could type with limited use of her fingers, then with the aid of her mouth stick until her neck muscles began weakening from post polio syndrome. About that time, one of her brothers convinced her to consider voice recognition software for computer. She began using it in 1993 or so, along with a computer whose microphone and screen can be swung into place by her mother. And this is not her mother, this is Susan Todd, so you know. Words have always been important to me as a reader first, Purrington says. I've always had more time to read than most people, so I read more than most people. Most days, my life doesn't feel limiting, she says. I work at keeping my mind occupied and challenged. I read some books for entertainment, but I try to balance that with books that keep me thinking because the days go better that way. Her travel is restricted to moving back and forth between the turtle shell of her daybed and the fiberglass port along device at the foot of her bed that provides enough ventilation for nighttime sleeping. It takes two people to help move her small body into the transparent chamber, which she jokingly refers to as looking like sleeping beauty vault. Language is a freeing medium that's let her travel far beyond the limits of her fragile body. In this world, I never will walk a trail of a mountainside, she writes, but I can sail with the clouds that visit the highest peaks. Words are wings, words are gifts for singing and giving away. In two of her books of verse, the trees bleed sweetness and a pattern for this place. Purrington has imagined the lives of an Indian, American Indian woman and a woman settler from Boston, respectively, living as she has on Wilson Hill. I've taken on the voices, vocabulary, and lives of hundreds of people, she says. Poetry has allowed her to go where prose never could. Her writing has once was once inspired by Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, or John Donne, says Purrington. Yet, I always felt traditional poetry was too wordy for what I wanted to say. I think I'm a person who's drawn to concision of speech and Yankee understatement. The 119 short poems review recalling the death of her eldest sister, her first romance, her 16th birthday, and in her 40s, having to count the costs of living with a seriously disabled body and acknowledge to myself that I wasn't going to outgrow them, that they had limited my life in ways that would affect me until I died. She writes, the days I did not sing, the nights I did not dance, their joy spiraling out of the throat of hermit 
a hermit thrush. The balance between the physical limitations she feels in her bones and the freedom in her soul shifts from day to day, she reflects. I don't think I feel trapped by my body because my mind and my voice are free. Joy and beauty are wings for me. And this is some of her writing and some of her books. So that's, um, that's Carol Purrington. The next uh, story I want to read is about um, Wally and Juanita Nelson. And it's the dates, uh, the story dates from 1980. Wally and Juanita Nelson are close to the soil. They're picking weeds from a patch of oak leaf lettuce on their hillside farm. It is warm on Woolman Hill where the two subsistence farmers have been working for six years, but the breeze makes it comfortable. Nelson's slight gray beard gives the only hint that he's 71 years old. His contemporaries are retired, living on fixed incomes. But like his wife, he remains close to his work, close to his convictions. The couple is so much at peace in their work the landscape of the 100-acre Quaker-owned farm where they are tenants, so tranquil. It's difficult to imagine them imprisoned repeatedly through the years for those convictions. They met, in fact, in prison. Juanita grew up dirt poor in Cleveland, so dirt poor in Cleveland, that her winning a poetry prize at 17 was how her family could afford her first telephone. She attended Howard University on scholarship and studied journalism at Western Reserve University and then reported for a Cleveland weekly newspaper where she worked on a story about discrimination in the jails. Nelson, a World War II conscientious objector who had grown up in Little Rock, was serving 33 months in a Cleveland prison for walking out of a civilian public service camp where he'd been assigned to do alternate service. Juanita, whose black hair has touches of gray, has spent three hours of jail in Washington, D.C. after forcing service of a cup of hot chocolate in an all-white drugstore. It was not an isolated arrest for her or, for, or in the effort to desegregate the nation's capital. The Nelsons have been repeatedly arrested investigated, and they say badgered since 1948 when they stopped paying taxes and even filing income tax returns because they disagreed with spending money for war purposes and other programs they see as unjust. During the Red Scare of the early 1950s, when they lived in Cincinnati, the Nelsons numbered among Americans unjustly branded communists. The mood was very bad. The people were so fearful, it was hard to get anything done. I just didn't pay any attention to it, Juanita says. But her husband, who had been part of the fledgling Congress of Racial Equality's journey in reconciliation, challenging the South's Jim Crow laws in the late 1940s, and then challenged discrimination in Cincinnati, left CORE when the organization became politicized and banned communists as members. The couple made their way through Cincinnati and Philadelphia, New Mexico, and a couple of communes, gradually coming to the realization that if they were to see their convictions through, they had to become more self-reliant. Their aim is not only to avoid being exploited, but also to avoid becoming exploiters. If there are winners in life, Juanita reasons, there have to be losers. Rather than be either, the Nelson simply refused to play the game. I don't use electricity, she says simply, because I don't like the system that would bring it to me. Their hand-built house also has no telephone and no running water, but an ingenious gravity-reliant system supplies the liquid from a small tub fed by water hauled upstairs to their loft. They heat and cook with wood, and they even make their own soap. A subsistence farm in the purest sense of the word is an impossibility, Wally Nelson acknowledges. There's no purity, he says. Yet their half acre oversized garden, dubbed the bean patch, does provide 75% of the couple's food. 
and they preserve much of that food for year-round use. The year-round use. And in their 1965 Dodge pickup, the Nelsons trucked the remaining lettuce, peas, carrots, and other vegetables to the Greenfield Farmers Market, which they helped organize in 1975, where they work each weekend provides them with most of the between $2,000 and $2,500. They figure it costs them to survive a year, half of that spent on the truck. They also sell their vegetables to area restaurants. The Nelsons are not immune from jolts in the nation's economy. Their expenses have doubled from the thousand dollars they figured they needed 20 years ago, although they're trying to limit spending to $2,000. Combined with the lack of insurance, the threat of failing health is their greatest personal worry. Yet they have stayed healthy. And Wally Nelson, who calls the national economy crazy and artificial, believes solidly in their hands-on direct approach. There's all this real work to be done and people can be producing food. I know if I have land, there can be food and people can be fed. I'm less at the whims of the people who try to affect the economy. The movements that approximate the Nelson's ideals come and go with the decades but the Nelsons remain committed. If you believe in something, it's forever, says Juanita. If you can't build on what you've done before, you're not getting any place. It's very sad to see people who've graduated and go on to something else. Your life is your action. Wally has watched his contemporaries speak out, build careers, and fall back into retirement. Years back, they stopped getting a kick out of life, he reflects. Life stopped being exciting for them. Calmly, doggedly, the Nelsons defy the system that they feel works against their ideals. At times, other campaigns, the anti-nuclear movement or the anti-war movement, for example, complement their values. But the Nelson stand, for the most part, is made on the farm rather than at the demonstration site. If I have anything to say, Nelson reflects, it's because I've got my feet planted and I know where I am. I always know why I'm here. That's been at the heart of their standing outside the system, of their standing close to the land. I have to know why I'm doing something, Juanita Nelson says. For me, the reasons are still there. They haven't changed. Wally Nelson died in 2002. Juanita Nelson died in 2015. And that's Wally and Juanita. Uh, and there's Archie. Hi, Archie. Hi. I just want to say something, uh, Richie, about going back to Carol. Yeah. I can sing, I can dance, I can I... walk. I can... Am I there? Yeah. And I, can, I can do everything in life, but I could never express it as beautifully as she did in her poetry. It's amazing that with her disability, she could enjoy life so much. And she can help us enjoy life so much as yeah. well. Yeah. Richie, I'd like to say something too. Sure. Um, Arch, Arch and I were always looked forward to reading your column in the recorder. And we believe that local, local reporting um, and local newspapers are incredibly important, just as you do. We've always felt that that what you have written exp really does express the heart and soul of this area that we love so much. And we're very, very grateful to you for doing what you do. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and the recorder is um, like this amazing mirror of this um, I, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm just so thankful that I wound up where I did. And I, I look back on it now in, in uh, hindsight and think, my God, did I really get to do that for all those years? How did, how did that happen? Um, so, um, and it, you know, the recorder still uh, is struggling, uh, mm -hmm. like all newspapers are struggling, but um, the people there are uh, really dedicated to, to getting uh, stuff out that really reflects the community. Um, 
And I mean, one of the, um, the, the, the amazing, really amazing thing was that um, I got to do this in addition to, you know, covering, um, you know, the, 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 new, the nuke plants and the pipeline and the meetings and the, all, all the stuff that was going on, environmental issues and whatnot, day to day. And, um, and yet they let me also do uh, stuff that really mattered to me that seemed like it really did reflect this, um, this community, so. So Richie, it's Court again, I'm sorry. I, I hope I'm not talking too much, but I, no. I remember coming in here, moving here in 1980 and noticing the editorial policies. And uh, I remember Tim Blagg was, was very uh, active back then. I feel that over the years now, it's been what, 40 years, I guess. Uh, I think that the editorial policy and the, the way the, the paper covers the community has really transformed. And in some ways, you have you came to be the voice um, of of the recorder as it as it um, as you got towards the end of your career, and I think that's reflecting how I felt uh, being a part of the a part of Franklin County over the forty years. And I wonder if you would want to comment on how you think the recorder reflects what's happened in Franklin County over the years or has been affected by it or has affected it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a combination of all that. And it's the, you know, the recorder is like a, um, it's a team, it's a team effort and it's really made up of lots of people who work their uh, tails off trying to, uh, you know, do, you know, the, the work that I was doing in 1976, the recorder, that was still, uh, we still had the typewriters and we still had just, it had just gone off hot, hot type. And um, it has changed so much and, and the demands on um, people there um, have increased, you know, dramatically. So that now you're constantly on a treadmill to put stories out, um, but I think that the reason the reason that I well I left the recorder to to sort of, uh, for a year and a half I went out to Springfield became the the arts editor down there and the weekend editor um, and uh, I did it mostly to to, to because I didn't believe I could leave. Uh, and I, I did it to prove to myself that I could actually leave if I wanted to. And then once I was there, I thought, I must have been crazy um, because this is, it felt like such a community to me and it still feels like a, 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 a genuine community out there. And I could reach out and uh, get a sense of who I was writing for all the time. And I think that the recorder just does, has done such a, a great job as a semi-independent, semi semi-privately run newspaper um, that's smart of a small group of papers. And uh, most of the time, uh, papers are owned by you know, corporations and uh, there's this bureaucracy and you really lose touch with, with what, who you're writing for. And I always had a really strong sense of who I was writing for mm -hmm. at the recorder. And I think, I think that's still the case, much, much more so than at other papers. And I think that the, the, the paper is, uh, you know, the, the community's really reflected, uh, really appreciated that. And it's sort of, gone back and forth and felt really like home in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now that, um, you know, now that I'm uh, peddling these books with the disadvantage of uh, a pandemic, it's meant that I've only been able to do these readings um, online and I've and I've really insisted on 
um, getting the word out that if, that people who want to buy copies of the book, uh, you know, certainly go to the library and, and read it. But if you want a copy for, for you know, family or for to have, um, that people should do it at the local bookstore. So the World Eye has it, and Boswell's has it, and um, Broadside has had it, and has it in uh, and Sawyer's has had it in Shelburne Falls. And, uh, and pe when people say, well, where, you can, where can I get the book? I say, well, you can get it at the stores or you can get it on my website, um, richiedavis.net. Um, and I've even offered to, you know, go out and, you know, deliver it to people and give you the hand, you know, autographed copies rather than, um, rather than the simplicity of just, you know, going online and, and having Jeff Bezos um, prime it to you. Um, so it's another expression of this local community that, that's really, um, that Wally and Juanita were, were all about. So. Any other questions that people have? Can I make a comment, Richie? Sure. I know you've uh, interviewed thousands of people for the recorder. And I feel very honored to be one of them. You've interviewed me several times, and I've always enjoyed your interviewing. You're a great newspaper man. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, the, trying to uh, decide which stories, and I'm I'm now working on a second um, second volume of stories, and. Um, so again, I'm I'm um, struck with so what do I include? What what do I, you know, what what should be in here? And again, I'm looking for stories that are universal and and yet really go deep into these local characters. Um, and I don't know, there's so many lo so many characters um, <laughs> that it's hard to hard to decide you know where to go with it, but. Um, hoping that I can wrap that up pretty soon. I just have a quick comment. One of the, of the beauties of, of having your book is that the people, for example, Carol and, you know, the people that, and, and uh, Wally and Juanita, they live in our house with us because they're on the bookshelf. And that, that's really a lovely, a, a lovely gift to anyone who has the book. So thanks for that. I, I really like that you're collecting them. And if you're working on a second collection, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and incidentally, I wrote, to, uh, I wrote to Carol today or yesterday and told her that I was planning to do a reading. Um, and when I, when I first put the book out and wrote to her, um, I didn't know whether I was gonna hear back from her, but she wrote back uh, immediately and she was like delighted and, and so, um, so grateful and it's just like to know that she's that she's still uh, on people's shelves and that somebody could go to the library and um, you know look for a book and find find her and then the other the other thing about the book that I didn't get into this book um, but I did get managed to get onto my website and there's a there's a little there should be a little marker in your book that points you to the place on on my website um, where there's a resource page where each of the stories has um, references to other material about Carol, about Wally and Juanita, about all of these people. So if anybody is really um, turned on by um, any of the stories, they can dig further and um, pretty much all of them have that. And there's a story in there about I don't know how many people have have read the book or not, but there's a story in there about the Quabbin, um, and it goes into all these oral. There are oral histories of the Quabbin that are um, that you can tap into from this book. So um, and oral histories of Juanita also. Um, so it's all there. So Richie, yeah. Um, what were the challenges to writing about the people in your own home area, especially when you had to cover some of the harder stories? You mean originally? Yeah. Um, 
Well, the challenge is, the challenge was always trying to find the the, uh, the time to get to you know to make the time to do that and to sort mm -hmm. of push other things aside. The biggest thing that helped there was the editors who allowed me to um, spend time. I mean, to do a series of articles like I did um, with Norton Juster and Ar Arnold Black and uh, Barry Mosier and um, Je Jeannie Zeiger and uh, talk with them about creativity. Um, and I remember the day that I suggested that um, to uh, Roger Bowman, who was the arts editor at the time. And I said, what if, we did, what if I did a whole series on creativity and it could run on the arts and entertainment page one day on the, the front page uh, on Friday and then on Saturday's Life and Time page. She said, oh, that's a great idea. And uh, that just let me go do it. And that's unheard of. It's really unheard of. Um, but, I, uh, but, you know, going, going off, I never really had any uh, resistance from anybody to do mm -hmm. anything that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it was always, this was, this was always the stuff that I loved to do the most to really get out, uh, get out from behind the desk and run out to, mm -hmm. to spend time and, you know, with Gerald Fox and, and do a story about Susie Pellucci or do a, you know, a story about Archie Maynan's uh, uh, making uh, menorahs and, and, and uh, you know, trying to understand why why people did stuff and what what the what the what the inner meaning was for them, and um, that's that's really where my heart was, and so I got to live with my heart for, for uh, all that time. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments um, that you haven't already asked or said? One of, the, one, of the, one of the strange things about the book is that there aren't any sort of there aren't many stories here. Or I don't know if there are any stories about agriculture, and agriculture was like my um, well, I don't want to say my deepest love, but because there were so many things that I love about about writing in Franklin County, but one of them was um, agriculture, the, the principal one. And I did this, I mean, I created a beat again. I said, what if I, what if I created a beat where it was ener energy and environment and the energy was obvious because we had two nuke plants and we had, you know, all it was, a, it was, this was a hub of alternative energy uh, or that's what it was called at the time. And, um, and also farming and um, all these environmental issues like erosion of the river and everything. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Why, why, why don't you do it? And um, so I, I could run and do that. And um, so I'm, I, I'm hoping to get some of those agricultural stories in the second, um, the second book. Richie, when are you expecting to uh, get the second book together? Are you working on that now? I'm working on it now, but I haven't, uh, haven't uh, brought it to uh, publisher yet. Okay. But, uh, I've gotten some of the permission and uh, get it to the publisher by the end of the year. Nice. Okay. I think that if there are no more questions or anything, um, we could call it an evening. Um, thank you. As I said before, thank you everyone for coming. And Richie, this was absolutely wonderful. I hope you'll come back in some form hopefully in person, um, next time around with your new book. So thanks everyone. Oh, and if you would like a recording of the event, just uh, contact me at the Arms Library um, by email or by phone number, and I'll send that right out to you. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.